Hey, this is Teresa from the Hormone Genius Podcast. Thanks for listening to this very important episode. I want to make a couple clarifications right off the bat. In this episode, I will talk about ketones, keto nutrition, and I want to make sure I say everything scientifically correct. So first and foremost, when you hear me talk about where ketone bodies are produced, I want you to know that ketones are produced in the liver. We have a way of in the body making either fuel from either sugar or carbohydrates or from a backup fuel, which is ketones, which come from burning fat. But this happens in the liver. Secondly, I mentioned a doctor named Dr. Mary Newport, and I talked about a book that she wrote, and I want to make sure I get the book right because some of you might want to pick it up. It's very excellent. The book by Mary Newport is Alzheimer's Disease, What If There Was a Cure?, And the book that I mentioned, The End of Alzheimer's, is actually written by another very amazing physician named Dr. Dale Bredesen. So both of those are excellent. I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode. So without further ado, here is the episode, Question and Answer with Teresa on Ketogenics. I do want women to know that there is an alternative to suppressing their bodies with hormones, that they can see their body as a good and they can live in that body holistically. Totally. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Join co-hosts Jamie Rauchy and Teresa Kenny as they educate women about the beauty of the feminine design and empower women to take charge of their health. They're going to be so amazing. You're going to be so empowered by understanding your feminine genius and your hormone genius. I don't think I can live my whole life knowing this and not sharing it with anyone. Everyone, and welcome to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Teresa and I are going to have an amazing episode, and I'm excited to really dig into this topic, Teresa. We are going to be navigating nutrition and hormones, and specifically, we're going to dig into ketogenics. And so in this episode, I have the honor and I get to ask Teresa all of my questions about ketogenics, nutrition, and hormones. And it's going to be a back and forth conversation, of course, as it always is. Um, But again, I'm just really looking forward to learning a ton from you, Teresa, about this topic. Yeah, no, I'm excited too. Um, Obviously, you know, we, you know, lots of stuff on the internet, right. About different types of nutrition. And first and foremost, I want to say, you know, I'm not in some sort of a camp, you know, in terms of what I propose to patients in terms of what they do. I happen to be very interested in ketosis and its effect on health and its effect also on sometimes um, women's ability to lose weight. But by no means should anyone think that I'm some sort of a, you know, only a ketogenic diet pusher. You know, I believe there's all sorts of tools that people can use in health. And I think this um, area of ketosis is very interesting and very proven to have an impact on health. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But there is a wide variety of things out there and each individual person is unique and how their bodies work. So more than anything, people need to remember that. And also just that, again, this is not medical advice, you know, that you really always should talk to a doctor when you're going to possibly make a change, um, in the way that you feed your body nutritionally. Amen. Uh, it even makes me think of just the number of times I've been asked personally, just through the consults that I do with women, you know, what kind of you know diet do you recommend for hormones? I'm like, oh dear, like there are so many factors when it comes to that. And Teresa and I were talking a little bit about um, one of the factors before this episode is just even how like our body image and the relationship we have with our body. So we realize that this can, maybe it could be triggering for some, but just know we're coming at it just from the scientific um, perspective on this one, you know, particular um, way of eating and how it affects hormones. Um, So with that, Teresa, tell our listeners and tell me a little bit about what ketosis even is. Sure. Yeah. So let me just first say, I mean, there's a reason why I became particularly interested in this. I was very blessed 
and honored to be a speaker at a conference in 2017 called Tripping Over Truth. And that conference was hosted by Dr. George Yu of the George Yu Foundation, very well-known um, physician. Um, he's actually a pelvic surgeon and I got to meet him. He actually came to learn about hormones um, at the place that I worked at Pope Paul VI. So he asked me to be a speaker at this conference. And when I got there, you know, I didn't know exactly everything that was going to be talked about, but I was absolutely blown away. Tripping over truth was um, actually about um, looking at the me metabolic approach to health, basically. So when we talk about metabolism, we're talking about how our body uses energy. And um, they were looking at different areas of health, including it's um, the mental health or cognitive health of people. So the area of dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's was being looked at, and also cancer research was being looked at. And of course, how we can look at metabolism and energy and ketosis and its influence on these disease states. I was there to talk about hormones and the influence of hormones on the body. And I got swept up into this entire world around ketogenics. So it, I learned so much. And because my mother has had Alzheimer's for now over well over 10 years, I became in, instantly kind of interested in how that it could impact her health, but also my own. And there's a doctor named Dr. Mary Newport out there too, who was doing incredible research. She's a pediatrician whose husband developed early on stage dementia. And she wrote a book called the end of Alzheimer's. Um, so if you're interested in ketosis from this standpoint of dementia, I would really recommend Dr. Mary Newport but she was looking into um, ketosis and how it affect the brain. And her husband was involved in kind of individual patient case studies with different products that would raise his ketones. And what they found is it had an incredible and a dramatic improvement in his cognitive health in the state of dementia. So he was able to, you know, they, in medicine, sometimes we'll help people do a couple of things to determine how cognitively well they are. One of them is to draw a clock and to give them a time on that clock and say, draw this time, draw the clock, put the numbers on it and draw the clock at this time. And what they showed is that if they could raise this, um, her husband's ketones, he would all of a sudden be able to draw the clock when before getting something that caused his ketones to increase, the clock couldn't be drawn. So kind of a miraculous improvement. And I, and Dr. Mary Newport did a lecture at this conference I was at, and I saw the pictures, I mean, incredible. Mm. And so I was, you know, inst instantly like amazed by what this meant. So that's the reason why I have an interest in it. It's not just because there's this keto diet out there and people are using it to lose weight. My interest is, is it, is that it impacts health. So, and I'm, I'll have to, you know, I don't know if you want me to pause there, Jamie, if you have any questions about that, but cause now I need to go into what is it, keto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Teresa, I didn't know any of what you just said about that interest. I knew that you did like a little 30 day keto diet diary thing. I think you said like in the spring, um, I knew, you know, that you bring it up from time to time. And I've just always wondered, you know, what was it about that, um, that interests you? So it makes a lot of sense that it's, you know, this, this concern, even for your own health in terms of like genetics and your mom and all that. So I'm just interested in learning more. So yeah, as you were talking about, um, ketones and ketosis and all of that, um, even for my own sense of understanding, I would love for you to even tell us what that is. Like what are ketones? Right. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So ketones is just a form of fuel basically. Um, and you know, this, this is why we're talking about this on the hormone genius podcast is this really still has everything to do with hormones. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it does is because the state of the human body is to make fuel to create energy so that our bodies work right. Most of us live in a state of what we call carbohydrate burning or sugar burning essentially. But if we look at our bodies from an evolutionary standpoint, 
remember that we didn't, you know, we didn't evolve uh, originally to be eating six meals a day. And particularly it didn't involve donuts, pancakes, pop tarts, and any sort of carbohydrate loaded breakfast. Mm -hmm. You know, the evolutionary state of the human being was that food wasn't available at a dinner table, that food had to be gathered, that food had to be killed and slaughtered and cooked you had to grow it. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, we have to remember that our bodies are meant to be able to withstand long periods of time without sugar. Mm -hmm. But, you know, over whatever the last thousands of years, we've changed that. And we have now kind of become kind of total sugar burners instead of this idea that originally our body should have been kind of going back and forth into a state of sugar burning but maybe even mostly staying in a state of non-sugar burning. So what does it mean then, you know, to not sugar burn? Well, if I deplete myself of, the, or, you know, there's an absence of sugar. And again, all carbohydrates, basically, when I say that kind of they, the fuel will turn into sugar, whatever carbohydrate, rice, potatoes, um, berries, you know, that's all a sugar. Um, sugar is basically you know, with the help of a hormone called insulin can be used as fuel. Mm -hmm. But what if I make that absent completely? Um, if I don't have any carbohydrates, the body has to continue to survive. And so the body will go into the muscle and it will take, you know, something called ketone bodies from there. And ketone bodies are these little like powerhouses of fuel. And they actually can be utilized directly in the body without the hormone insulin. And so remember like in, you know, school, you learned about like mitochondria and the Krebs cycle and the formation of, um, ATP. So again, most of us have to use sugar to make energy or are making, uh, you know, energy through a, a basis of acquiring sugar for that. But if you don't have that ketone bodies basically go directly into the cell, they form ATP in the mitochondria. Um, but they do it at like three times the level, you know, the energy even level is is higher than if you actually have to use the hormone insulin for fuel. And that's why people, when they talk about, Oh, I had so much energy when I was in a state of ketogenic diet, or, you know, like my brain felt so much clearer. Well, there's a reason for that because ketone bodies, their performance, their fuel performance is actually three to four times higher. It takes a while for the body to go to the state of ketosis, because even if you have, you know, a certain amount of time that you have not eaten, let's just say, I don't know, you, you skipped breakfast, you still have what we call glycogen stores or sugar stores that come from the liver. So your body still goes there first. That's why it can take sometimes people, um, several days to get into a state of true ketosis because the body still has kind of a backup storage in the liver of glycogen. Um, so the body has to deplete all that first. And, um, you know, there's, there's two ways to look at this. Every time we go to bed at night, obviously we don't eat. And for a long period of time, we're not eating. So there is a sense that the body will go into that alternative fuel source overnight to some degree, although we don't have as much energy needs overnight is either. But as you continue to deny the body carbohydrates or sugar, the body again, will go into this alternative fuel state. So for example, um, if you do intermittent fasting, so people, you know, hear that word, that also being a buzzword, intermittent fasting you know, is, is that the same as ketogenics? Um, it could be, but it doesn't have to be because again, there's multiple ways to think about going into ketosis. I go into ketosis if I just don't eat for certain amounts of times, or I fast for certain amounts of times, but there's another way that you can go into ketosis and that's just starving nutritionally, the body of sugar. So when you starve the body of sugar, you know, instead I don't eat carbohydrates. I eat fat mostly and a certain amount of protein. Then the body again has to go into a state of ketosis. So there's two mechanisms of action. You could say to actually get to that state. Mm -hmm. um, and over a period of again, days, like if I go into that ketogenic diet, like I've done several times, you know, basically if I just continue to either fast 
or not eat carbohydrates or a very low amount of carbohydrates, then my body will stay in this alternative state of fuel production. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the reason why there is this association with weight loss is because the body actually has to get either again, these fuel sources from muscle or fat cells. So once you kind of burn up through kind of what you can get from muscle without breaking it down, we don't want to break down muscle. The body has to oxidize fat cells. Um, and so those ketone bodies then can be come from your fat. So it, literally you become a fat burner instead of a sugar burner, you're becoming a fat burner. And if you stay in that state a, a longer period of time and and your hormones are working correctly. And this is a huge key piece of all this. Your hormones have to work correctly to do this. Your body will, will burn off fat. And for some people that can happen pretty quickly. So that's kind of the principle of how ketosis works. Okay. That's super helpful. So two, two thoughts come up. Um, the first thought is, you know, how you can buy ketones like people are like oh get my ketones okay i want to talk about that because i i honestly i see it but i don't really i don't understand it nor do i use them um and then the second thing i want to talk about too i'm just going to say it now so i don't forget um is this whole idea like you said you know if our body becomes like a fat burning machine and um and the key that Teresa said was that our hormones must be healthy and balanced and well because i could see again there are a subset of women and I would include myself in the subset who has the type of personality where if I wasn't able, let's say I'm not getting pregnant very easily, um, but I'm eating well and maybe I'm, you know, increasing my, even my fats and my healthy proteins and all that, my healthy fats and my proteins, um, how I'm still maybe burning off too much fat to even allow myself to ovulate because the body does need a certain amount of fat to be healthy and well. And, and we know that estrogen is stored in fat cells and we know we need fat cells and we need fat to be a fertile woman. Mm -hmm. So either one of those we can start with, we could talk about the ketones, but I also want to talk about that part of it, the hormone part of it. Okay. So the exogenous ketones. So again, there, I talked about the natural way you can get into a state of ketosis. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and again, I want to emphasize how important this is the fact that because ketone bodies do not need insulin, they can directly impact a cell for energy. And this is really important to the state of when I talked about Alzheimer's or any form of kind of cognitive decline, you know, the newest research around Alzheimer's, they call diabetes of the brain. It's basically the starvation or inability of the brain to use sugar because insulin has a harder time getting to the brain, um, in a state of dementia. So the reason why people have researched and studied this cognitive enhancement with using therapeutic ketosis is because ketone bodies will go directly to the brain and be able to be used as energy. So when we take an exogenous ketone, that's different than, again, just starving the body of carbohydrate fuel. An exogenous ketone is generally something called beta hydroxybutyrate and beta hydroxybutyrate, you know, they hear in the, those drinks, maybe um, also sometimes um, at the highest level, even referred to as keto esters, but they have an ability to raise ketones just therapeutically. So through the process of, you know, metabolizing beta hydroxybutyrate, they can raise ketone bodies. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of you out there have heard of like the bulletproof coffee. Oh yeah. You know? Um, that is a, a, an exogenous way, something that you're intaking to raise ketones. So the reason why bulletproof can raise ketones is because it has something called, um, MCT in it. MCT stands for medium chain triglycerides. It comes from coconut oil and that particular, um, fat actually raises ketone bodies. And so when people drink that in the morning, not only can they allow for a higher kind of potentially metabolism of fats, but they get an energy source from it. And so again, people might say, when I drink a bulletproof coffee in the morning, my brain feels great. You know, I have so much energy because for them, those raising of the ketones. And if you don't, you know, put that with a, any carbohydrate, 
that is being used directly as fuel. So an exogenous ketone is just anything that without doing anything else, you know, without fasting, without, you know, starving myself of carbs, I can raise my ketone bodies. Mm. Um, and that's something I do myself personally. At times I use something, um, Oh, I can't remember thinking what it's called. It's a keto drink, but in the afternoons, um, when I've been doing kind of some intermittent fasting and just kind of working with these things to see how they make me feel, I will do a keto drink in the afternoon around 3 PM. Um, and for one reason is, is I like to keep my meals meals and not snack. Um, but because 3 PM might be a time people kind of lose energy. So, you know, I can fuel my brain up with a keto drink and I'm like, my brain's running on super fuel. It feels like, Mm. Um, so it is quite amazing kind of just what ketone bodies can do for the brain. Mm -hmm. And again, when this Dr. Mary Newport, who studied her, you know, husband with the dementia, they were just using coconut oil, straight up coconut oil can be used. Um, for the same reason. And I'll, and I'll say this too. Um, I jumped on the bulletproof coffee bandwagon and I'm glad I did because it's amazing, but I didn't know what that meant for the longest time when people talk about bulletproof. So I'm just going to tell our listeners what that even is. Okay. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it makes me want to drink it again. I just kind of lost, lost the flair, but, um, grass fed butter, MCT oil. What I would do is I would brew coffee. And again, if you really want to get into it, coffee like when you buy a bag of coffee at the grocery store or wherever like it is likely that there is mold so you want to actually buy a clean healthy non-mold coffee (laughs) just by the way so if you really want to go after it so clean coffee secondly is a pad of butter um grass-fed butter and then i think maybe a tablespoon or something of mct oil and then what i would do is i would froth like i'd put it all together and i'd froth it because of course the the coffee will melt the butter um and i'd froth it and it, there'd be like this beautiful foam and it was delightful like very decadent and creamy and delightful i never would have thought i'd put butter in my coffee but it makes me want to do that again um yeah. so that's what bulletproof coffee is just for people who don't know what that Yeah. And it's a, you can make a variety kind of, of ways to do it. You could say too. Some people use, you know, if they're okay with dairy, like whipping cream can be used instead because whipping cream, if you didn't know, actually has no carbohydrates as well. Oh, okay. Instead of like the butter you're saying. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Okay. Super helpful. Yeah. So Um, let's talk about the hormone aspect of it, Jamie, because again, I want to make this clear. This is truly a hormone thing. So when there are women out there, they're like, I did the keto diet and it didn't do anything for me. You know, it didn't work for me. Well, absolutely. There are people out there that are going to do certain nutritional pathways and they're not going to work. So number one, you ask the question, maybe why, but two, maybe that's not the right tool for you and your body. So again, tools in a toolbox, you know, paleo Mediterranean, just focusing on getting out, um, you know, the, the processed foods in the diet. And first and foremost, I mean, no one really should be doing a keto diet. If they haven't first probably said, I should probably get out potato chips, donuts, and pop tarts out of my diet first. You know, there are just general principles of health that again, make clear sense. Um, and, And also remember this, you know, people again, get in these camps, but there is this still very general principle of calories in calories out. That is true. And the reason why sometimes people in any store sort of a change, like maybe they fast a little bit longer through breakfast or, um, you know, maybe even through the ketogenic diet, they probably are intaking less calories. So part of weight loss is truly a just calorie in calorie out, but it's not just that because hormones are real and hormones impact everything. And so insulin is kind of the key hormone. We always need to think about Mm -hmm. in terms of our health, in terms of its impact on our bodies, on weight and inflammation. So think about this. And I I try to tell this to patients. If I get up in the morning and the first thing I do is eat a, a parfait, a yogurt parfait with granola and berries sounds really healthy, right? But I will get a huge insulin spike from that. Then imagine I get hungry at 10 AM because that often happens when you eat a pretty heavy carb breakfast. Then I eat an apple or a banana, huge spike in insulin. Um, then at lunch, I might need a healthy salad, um, 
you know, a lesser spike in insulin, maybe by three o'clock I'm hitting a crash. I run to the gas station, you know, to grab something again, huge spike in insulin. So we have kind of developed this routine of eating multiple times a day. And because of that, our load of insulin is just too high. And when the load of insulin is high chronically over a period of time, not only does that create inflammation in the body, but it creates insulin resistance. So hyperinsulinemia or too much insulin leads to insulin resistance. Too much insulin is a problem, but the ability of the cell to even use your insulin, which is what insulin resistance is, is a huge problem. And all people out there who have been told that they have type two diabetes or even close to that, or a prediabetes, you hands down have been living in a state of hyperinsulinemia. Mm -hmm. What does something like ketogenics do to the body? When you, again, absence of carbohydrates or sugar, it is going to decrease your insulin significantly. And if we do that chronically a little bit over a period of time, not even extreme, we just, maybe we just intermittently fast. So we don't eat breakfast and we eat a, a, a close our feeding windows we are bringing down insulin. So if there's any takeaway point I would have for this podcast is that insulin is the driver of problems because insulin is the storage hormone. So anytime you, you make too much of it, the body says to itself, well, I got too much. And so I need to put that away for later. And so the, the reason why any nutritional tool that brings down insulin is going to be effective is because we have to have an absence of insulin or at least a deficit of insulin for the body to go into the state of taking out that storage. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to decrease that enough to the body saying, okay, now I can go to those fat cells and now remove that energy source because I finally need it. But if you chronically have insulin at high levels, which again, it just is a very common phenomenon in the way that we eat food today. You will not be able to go to that storage mode and you may be working out a lot. You may be feeling like you're eating healthy, but your body can't get to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, again, a tool becomes possibly using ketone bodies or a tool becomes fasting over a longer period of time because that allows the body to get to those storage places. So you know, as our listeners are kind of processing this information, I wonder if some thoughts they have and thoughts that I have is, okay, so the fact is that there is, there are fruits and there are carbs and there are things that are part of our diet and knowing about how, you know, insulin spikes can be harmful to the body and especially throughout the day, you know, um, it's important to think about maybe when we do have the sugars and the carbs, thinking about how we place them during our day within our meals. And so maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Like if we're going to have something that's sugary or carby, you know, when should we be eating those and during the day? Right. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so in general, carbohydrates work best at an earlier time of the day than a later time of the day. I mean, that's just kind of a general principle, but what I like to do with patients is I like to say, Hey, you know, let's, again, I, I focus on insulin because people think they need to focus on blood sugar, but again, blood sugar is not going to change. You know, we are really good at keeping blood sugar effectively normal for long periods of time in a state of unhealth. So it's not the blood sugar we need to be focused on. It's the idea of insulin. So I like to focus on the glycemic index of food. Cause I think that's really helpful because the higher the glycemic load of the food and particularly like high fructose foods, the more your insulin will will spike. And so if I can take a person, maybe I'm, again, I'm not telling them to, re, you know, reduce all their carbs. I'm not telling them to go ketogenic, but I do want them to understand these principles. I might say, let's, let's get, pull up a list of high glycemic foods and low glycemic foods. 
fruits and vegetables, particularly, which ones are a little bit higher glycemic in terms of the fruits? Well, apples, bananas, cherries, pineapple, those are all high glycemic, which fruits are lower glycemic and won't spike my insulin as much still will, but not, maybe not as much blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, lemons, limes. So that's helpful because I think you know, when, uh, I've had people, um, where literally they're eating bowls of apples, bananas, pineapples daily, cause it's healthy food. Right. But they're just chronically keeping their insulin levels way too high. Mm-hmm. And I've even had people, you know, just, I'll say, Hey, maybe fruit should be considered something more dessert like, and maybe we shouldn't eat it every day. Mm-hmm. Let's focus more on vegetables because we have to get to the idea that again, We've got to get our insulin levels down, um, over a period of, of time. And that's going to be really healthy ketone bodies themselves, ketones. And again, ketones just don't come from the muscle. They come from the liver. They can come from the brain. They can come from other sources. So it's not just the muscle, but ketone bodies themselves are anti-inflammatory. And this is like, again, they're doing all sorts of research on this, on how it affects the brain, how it affects cancer cells. So ketone bodies bring down inflammation, insulin at high too high of levels can increase inflammation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in terms of super helpful, by the way, super helpful information. Um, so let's say, you know, I wake up in the morning I have my bulletproof coffee. I want to make sure my insulin levels are stable throughout the day, but let's say there's a birthday party, you know, and I'm, I want a piece of cake, something that I learned that I thought was super helpful. And just in my own brain, how I imagine it is if I'm going to have something sugary or fruit or something to always make sure that you have like a protein and a healthy fat before. So like you wake up, you're, you, let's say you're just really hungry and you see donuts on the counter, but then you also know that you should scramble eggs, like eat the scrambled eggs first. And then if you're going to eat a half donut or whatever, eat the donut after. So that's kind of always my rule is what have I eaten anything in the last few hours? A I'm hungry B because I know I don't want to like drastically increase my insulin. I'm not going to go grab a candy bar right now after not having eaten anything for hours. You know, I'm going to try to like maybe eat a handful of nuts or something first, if that makes sense. Would you say there's truth to that? Oh, so, so much truth. And I, I would say again, a huge focus. I just want women to know is that protein is, is building. And we often just don't get enough muscle building tissue building is, is protein. And so, you know, there are some people that really believe we should be getting a full gram of protein per body weight, you know, so that's a lot of protein, but let's just say we even did kind of closer to that. I I try to focus on maybe women getting closer to about a hundred grams of protein a day, you know, because most women are going to be somewhere between 125 to 165, 75 pounds, maybe, you know, on average. So let's focus on a hundred. You are so right. Protein. We need good sources of, um, you know, I am a fan of animal protein. I do find that some of my patients that are vegans or vegetarians tend to struggle a little bit, but again, I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't value in, in reducing animal protein even and getting healthier sources of it. Like if I could tell people again, just eat salmon every day. Um, I think we'd all be healthy if we just ate salmon every day, you know, and didn't have to eat ground beef and some of these unhealthier sources of red meat, but protein, 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 and think about it as muscle tissue building. And then those healthy fats that are so important. Again, a, a, a truly healthy ketogenic diet should be, you know, over around 60 to 80% fat, which is a lot of fat, but this isn't the Atkins diet of the old days, which, you know, not that Atkins is all bad, but you know, the healthier fats, um, are what we're talking about. A clean keto is what they refer to it as so that the body uses that. And it's not again, promoting inflammation. It's truly decreasing inflammation. And then about, you know, 20 to 30%, no more than 30% protein in a, in a healthy ketogenic diet. And it's usually about 
10 to 20% carbohydrates. So that's usually for most people under 50 grams of carbohydrates to be in a therapeutic ketogenic diet. Um, again, and, and this has been well studied. I mean, the first research on ketogenics came out using it for patients who suffered from terrible migraines and terrible seizure disorders, children with seizure disorders and a ketogenic diet. And again, think about that, what it does in the brain, de all those ketone bodies, decreasing inflammation, stabilize that, um, that ability for the brain to have a seizure. So they found right away the therapeutic ab ability for ketones to heal the body. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, you know, we've, we've come a long ways in medicine, but because of industrialization of food because of the eighties and the whole low fat craze, we have really got ourselves upside down. And I think a lot of people out there are trying to say, let's go back to those evolutionary principles, you know, even the paleo diet, you know, how did our counterparts as humans survive? And let's look at the health of those people, you know, in terms of how their bodies, especially from at least from body fat and weight diseases like cancer, neurogenitive diseases, those things didn't happen at the rate they do now, diabetes, obviously the most obvious, we have an epidemic of those things. And so the idea that we would go back to a little bit more of an evolutionary type eating, whether it be fasting or keto or paleo, or even Mediterranean, um, all of those principles I think are good tools and no one should get overwhelmed by it, but people should at least start with the basics and the basics always are get to whole food eating, stop eating so much fructose and, you know, unadulterated sugar. Right. Right. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, Teresa, this is such an important topic because like much of what we learn, things can seem overwhelming, right? But the way you explained it, this doesn't seem that overwhelming. Like it seems to make sense, um, in terms, because again, like you said, in the eighties and the early nineties, you know, restricting ourselves from fat and having a low fat diet in ways when I did like the whole 30 in March, which was months ago, um, I was like, it was kind of fun. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to eat a bacon and I'm going to have fat and I'm going to have actual food. And it was fun. I didn't feel like it was restrictive at all. Um, I mean, it was a learning opportunity because I had a plan and I had to think about what I was going to eat. And so I think that's, what's so nice and empowering about this topic. Um, I do know that I'm sure many women are thinking, okay, and this is, this has to be a, another episode because I think this, this thing I'm going to bring up is a whole topic on its own PCOS and insulin resistance mm -hmm. and how we can tie that in. Cause of course, all of me wants to ask all about that right now, mm -hmm. but our time is basically up. Wouldn't you say, Teresa, in terms of the episode, is there anything you want to say though, as a carrot to women who are struggling with PCOS or have that question in their mind? I think anything from this episode, you certainly could take away with, I mean, all the principles of what we talked about hold true for PCOS and are beneficial, you know, just like they are to every human person, because you know, lowering insulin is effective for everyone. It's just in particular that PCOS already by its nature of its disease has an, an, of course, already the problem with insulin resistance. So it's even more important, but all of this would apply to that. And I would, I would say just as a carrot too, for every woman out there who is cycling again, our hormones change throughout the cycle. So we don't even need to eat the same at every point in the cycle, the same. And I, this could be a whole nother episode, but you know, during our follicular phase and our estrogen phase, our body is more, um, insulin sensitive really. And so our, we can build more muscle. We can, you know, generally we can fast a little longer. We can carbohydrate restrict a little longer. Um, in the luteal phase, the body is just preparing, right? If that progesterone is preparing the body for pregnancy, it's a little harder to do those things, to fast, to work out really hard. And we need to listen to our bodies and know those things. So don't do things and be unhappy. That's yeah. my carrot. Do not eat a certain way and not be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, that is counterintuitive. Uh, you know, certainly there's days that are a struggle if we're working hard, but you should feel joy in the choices that you've made around food. And we feel joy by feeling well too, and feeling good and feeling energetic. So generally we aren't going to feel well if we eat a donut in the morning. I mean, 
you know, it tastes good in the moment, it gets a dopamine hit, but it ain't going to last. Right. But eating healthy and, and doing the things that we know are good for our body brings us a good sense of joy that comes from a place of overall wholeness and goodness. Mm -hmm. So if you are unhappy and, and not feeling well with what you're doing, please listen to your body. You know, again, these are tools. You have to find the unique tool that works for your body and work with a professional to help you if you need guidance. And I think you can find the right one for you then. Yep. Amen. And often when we make that first choice to maybe put down that donut or even increase water intake, just anything that's small often begets more, you know, even healthier decisions. Like when I feel well, because I'm eating well, I'm on exercise When I exercise, then maybe I want to go to bed earlier at night. And it's like this whole effect. And so I think that's a key too, is thinking what's just one easy thing, you know, don't, don't get so overwhelmed with all of it. Just what's one easy thing. Cause that one easy thing will be get the next thing that might be a touch harder, but still healthy for the body. So just think of it in that way. So it doesn't overwhelm you, but Teresa, this is super helpful. Um, oh my goodness. And again, hopefully future episodes, we can dig into your experience when you went through that keto month of, and maybe some ideas for like recipes and that kind of thing. Um, if you guys have questions more so on this topic, I'm sure um, in the write-up, we can include maybe a couple of websites to visit or books to use as a reference guide. But as always, Teresa, thank you for teaching us so much about how the keto diet affects our body and hormones. And um, you guys, we're just so excited for this season. So thank you for listening to our podcast and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for listening to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Please remember to share our podcast with your friends and family and also follow us on social media. If you were not aware, we have a YouTube channel. So if you could like and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay in the loop with all of our latest episodes, we would appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support. We are excited to journey alongside you as you discover the beauty and the genius of your hormones.